Boom. Okay. We have come forward to probably, if this were a regular class, this would probably be the midterm week. Um, we have a fairly substantial piece of work to do, and I'm going to take this class today and the class next week to cover all of this so that I can make sure you guys get this. Let me give you some idea what I'm talking about. We are in module number three, and module number three is where I get the, I guess you could call it logo for our class. Module number three is about an idea called knowledge building. Now, knowledge building has been around for 20 some odd years, and I've been involved with it for, yeah, about that long. It comes from the minds of two researchers from the University of Toronto School of Education. Um, their names are Marlene Scardamelia and Carl Breider. Um, it's mainly Marlene's ideas, I guess you'd say. Carl is a big name in education. You just, we never hear it. I mean, he's right up there with Dewey. Um, he is the author, was the author for the University of Chicago of the Open Court Reading Series. Um, he also was part of the team that worked with SRA to create Distar. And he has a very interesting life story. I mean, he, he um, neither one of them are Canadian by birth. Uh, Carl uh, was uh, trained as an educational psychologist, kind of like um, our guy Richard Mayer in the 690 class. Uh, and he was very much a Skinnerian, which means that he's very much into you apply a stimulus and you get a response. Um, and if you've ever had, if you've ever had exposure to DISTAR, uh, there's all kinds of DISTAR. There's DISTAR math, DISTAR reading, DISTAR language. It's very much uh, stimulus and response kind of stuff. And then he met Marlene, who was one of his graduate students. And Marlene was always arguing with him about why do you see anything in this very closed way of, of looking at how kids learn? Because she's just the exact opposite. And they, uh, they became partners in every sense of the word. Um, and they have come up with this whole new way of looking at uh, teaching, which some people like to dismiss just as another theory. I don't. I don't. And we're going to go over sort of its ideas tonight. And then what I'm going to do next week is we'll actually go over how we're going to how you are going to do your demonstration of understanding of all this. One of the things that I think is so important with this, and you'll hear it time and time again, is you hear echoes of all the stuff we've had before. So, you know, you're going to hear people using terms like constructivism. You're going to hear people talking about inquiry-based learning. And you're going to hear about knowledge learning. You're going to hear all this over and over again. But the thing I want to focus on is that second one in the building structure, and that is collaboration. If we can build communities of learners inside an online class, we have fundamentally changed the paradigm of what online learning is. Um, again, here's another one of our terms. The Unfortunately, the way that online learning has populate it is it's pretty much the same classroom model but it's done through an online venue um, and people who do this people who run these online schools Phoenix etc you know they they realized right away this is a really simple 
in a cost-efficient way to, to do a class. Then we get to this guy, whose name is Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker is a very fascinating story. He was a top, top executive with General Motors in the United States. Um, he's right up there with the guys who designed the Corvette, Corvair. Um, but he had a different kind of bent to him. He was a kind of corporate exec who was really tuned in to the people who were doing the work. In other words, the guys and the gals on the, on the line that were building things. And he kept saying to his bosses that GM needed to realize that the people on the front lines of building cars understood the whole project better than the people who were the designers and the managers, specifically the managers. Well, Peter didn't. He wasn't very well liked for any of that. And he was forced out of GM. Now, this is in the late 1950s when car manufacturers were basically doing the big boats with the air fins, rocket ship look of automobiles. Peter Drucker goes off to Japan that was in the midst of trying to rebuild after World War II. And so he went there as a part of the Marshall Plan, and he met with the various titans of industry in Japan and was talking to them about how to rebuild Japanese uh, industry. And one of the things he was struck by was the very uh, paternalistic manner in which industry in Japan ran, some would say militaristic as well, that if you got a job working for somebody, you pretty much got that job for life. So Drucker walks in and brings in the ideas of what if we organize the people who build the cars? He wanted to do uh, automobiles because that was his background. What if we have people who build the cars actually come together with managers and talk about the car build and what they're seeing and what they think might be a good idea for improvement. And the rest, as I say, is history. Toyota came to the United States and basically kicked our butts for years and years, and still are, by the way. The Camry still is number one selling sedan in the United States. But they listened and they thought about what Drucker was saying to them, and they realized there was a lot of sense in it. Now, his term was called participatory management. That became a part of the Kentucky Education Reform Act. It was called PM. That got morphed over into SBDM, school-based decision-making. There is a direct line from our Reform Act's SBDM back to Peter Drucker. But here's where he also really became involved in education. This is one of his famous quotes. And I firmly believe in this. And if you look at that quote, one of the things that goes off in my head anyway is how it's very much a constructivist a constructivist idea. And those of us see it all the time in our teaching. If we are teaching well, kids start seeing the pieces and how they connect together. We were watching a um, video in class in 585 from a guy by the name of Larry Rosen. Larry has done a lot of research in uh, technology and kids in schools. And one of the things that, that people kind of gravitate to him is he's done some serious research on the idea that after 15 minutes, people kind of shut down. And it's like, you know, what we're sitting here doing right now, after 15 minutes, you kind of turned me off, but you have the luxury of being able to do that because you know there's video sitting here. We don't have that luxury in classrooms. 
And Rosen goes on to describe how our brains are basically wired with neurons. And then there's this coding that our, that our neurons gain as we experience new ideas and make them fit with old ideas. And when they look at older people, one of the things that they find is, people my age, one of the things that they find with us is this coding starts to thin out on our neurons and our synapses, those wires that run in our brains. In kids, by about the time of, of fifth grade, they're very, very thick. They have lots and lots of connections. Unless they grow up in very experientially poor uh, home lives. And then there's very little that goes on in terms of building new ideas. So where are we going with this? Well, let me show you. So if we truly believe that knowledge has to be improved, challenged, and increased constantly or it vanishes, the only way we can do that is through an idea of collaboration. This really ought to be collaboration slash community. Building a way for kids to have a safe environment so they can trot out their theories or their understandings or not being afraid to trot out an idea that they may have about whatever we're teaching, ideas to the center. And then the questioning, 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 questioning. Now, this can begin as the teacher gives a good essential question that he or she posts into the online community, which then starts driving the ideas to the center because kids in responding to the question are basically saying, well, this is what I think it means. And this is what I think it means. And then the collaboration piece is where we see kids coming together in the community that represents the online presence. And it's this wonderful, wonderful um, building of ideas, more ideas, new ideas that goes on and on and on. I'm going to pop down in here. I'm going to pull this PowerPoint up, Brittany, and I need you to tell me if you see it when it comes up. Don't need to have the macros, thank you. Now, if I go ahead and run this as a slideshow, do you see it now, Brittany, or is it gone? I can see it. Yeah, it's green. Good. All righty, here we go. Uh, CECL, Computer Supported Intentional Learning Environments, that was a program that I was very much a part of, helped run, was the lead on it um, in Jefferson County Public Schools a good 20 some odd years ago. So when you see that acronym here, don't let it throw you. What we're really talking about here is knowledge building. What was interesting about CECL was it was about 10 years ahead of itself. Um, it basically was a community of learners based in an online environment that was closed. By that I mean um, you couldn't get into it unless you were a student. And a Google Classroom is kind of like that, but you'll see when we get to Google Classroom how we can build it so it really supports this idea about kids playing around with the ideas of the curriculum. Well, you weren't supposed to do that. Let's try that again. Okay. You're going to do that again when I try to move through the slide? Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're just going to do that. So what I'll do is I won't blow it up. Okay. Can you see it if I do it this way? Yep. All right. Let's see if I can push it up and drag it out. 
Here we go. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So this little thing I'm going to run by you is all about the why and the what of knowledge building, the results of creating a knowledge building educational environment, and then employing it into a, a classroom. We're not going to talk about knowledge form or KBIP because they don't really exist anymore, unfortunately. But here's the, here is the crux of all this, the what and why of knowledge building. Pretty straightforward. No, all of learning is an active, constructive process. Every time we run into something new, we try to understand it based upon the stuff we've had before. I'm always fascinated by all the different devices now that are available to turn your house into a smart home. I just got through replacing like six light bulbs that I wanted to turn into a group so I could say to my Echo device, you know, turn on the bathroom lights and all the lights would all come on. Or I could say, turn on the bathroom lights, 50%, 10%, all that that you can do. Well, these are not devices that are necessarily um, built specifically for the Echo. They use another device or another piece of software that bridges it. But when I first started approaching this problem, my only experience was with working with Echo devices and Echo devices that work with it. And so I had to learn some new stuff to understand how to do it. But if you were to say to me, so I've bought an Echo device. I've got an Alexa floating around in my house. What do I do to make it work the lights in the house? You can't answer that. I can't answer that simply because there are like three, four different ways of connecting. So there's a constructivist process that goes on whenever you come across something new to understand what it is and how it fits into that prior learning. So the constructivism is a reality of learning founded on the premise that by reflecting on our experiences, we construct our own understanding of the world we live in. We generate our own rules and our own mental models which we use to make sense of our experiences. Learning is simply the process of adjusting our mental models to accommodate new experiences. The problem with this is and Mayer talks about this a lot in his research in using multimedia stuff, is that the constructivist process, nine times out of ten in school, leads to misconceptions about what we're trying to teach kids. And what research shows very clearly is misconceptions are really hard to overcome. Um, you would think that's the case. But when we're in a classroom and we're saying something to kids and they're saying, you mean this is the way it works? No, that's not what I mean. This is the way it works. It really has to be a process for that kid to take that misconception out and put in the correct way of doing it. This has nothing to do because we get this all the time, especially in math classes. You get those kids in math who just are dying to figure it out a different way than what the teacher is showing. That's just their reason to live. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the misconceptions, which are preconceptions that people bring to a task. Um, the wrong way, which I actually saw a teacher teaching one time in a K-tip, the wrong way of doing um, multiplying fractions. And it's, you just, when you see stuff like that, you just cringe. So we have to be careful about constructivism because it can lead us down some bunny holes that are bunny trails that we don't want to go down. But we have to realize that if we don't give kids a space, an opportunity to voice those preconceived ideas, those rules, those mental models. And if we don't do that in a safe environment, they're going to carry around that misconception. It's just the way our brain is wired. Uh, so this is a little video, which I don't think will play. Maybe it will. Let's see here. Yeah. So let me tell you what's in here. So this kid is talking to uh, Bill Cosby, who was doing the old Art Linkletter show, where kids say the craziest things. And they were talking about how old are your parents? And so he asked this little kid, and the kid says, um... He says, how old do you think your dad is? He says, oh, I think my dad's very old. He says, how old do you think he is? And the kid said, 
Oh, I think he is as old as um, when the, he, he saw dinosaurs when he was a kid. And that is such a classic example <laughs> of the, the notion, the mental model, the artifact of knowledge, knowledge that kids carry around that, you know, we all laugh at and say, oh, that's so cute. But it's so pervasive when you go into classrooms and watch kids. I mean, they say things that you just kind of cringe at and go, no, no. Unfortunately, in this day and age of everything being very political, we live with that with the adults as well. They'll say things that just aren't factually true. And you can't shake that. That's the danger of the constructivist model is that people carry around artifacts of knowledge, which they just know as being true. The other thing that, um, sorry, the other thing that Marlene talks a lot about is something she calls shallow constructivism. So what is shallow constructivism? You see this all the time, especially now that the, uh, the, the thing that we see in schools that's really popular is project-based learning. Um, you know, if I've gone into a K-TIP last year, if I didn't hear the word or the, the acronym PBL, I was stunned because that's, especially in Jefferson County, that is the thing. So in shallow constructivism, what it can look like is uh, kids are, are challenged to build a habitat to live on Mars. And when you do that, sure, you know, kids bring in oatmeal boxes and the teacher provides tape and they provide all kinds of doodads to build this thing. Totally bypassing all of the science, all of the biology, all of the math that you have to have to even consider whether building a habitat on Mars would be possible. Shallow constructivism is the danger of doing any kind of project-based learning with kids because we'll accept stuff that isn't necessarily either correct or is so shallow in its basis that it just doesn't hold up. So we have that in knowledge building, learning is an active constructivist process. The constructivism that should go on must be collaborative and it must be deep. It must be based upon real facts and knowledge. It can't just be, well, I think I could um, take a tent and put dirt inside the tent and inflate the tent. Now the tent wouldn't have the tent would have to be able to hold the air. And then I would plant plants in there. And then I would breathe carbon dioxide and the plants would take in oxygen in there. We could have a habitat on Mars. I actually saw that done one time. And if you read the book, The Martian. So, you know, you have to be careful about it. Understanding is critical. Understanding is critical. What does that mean? Well, let's look at what is a normal model of teaching. So the teacher receives information from a subject matter expert. Usually it's a curriculum design person in their school district. The teacher then, um, and that is informed by assessments and standards. And then that teacher develops the task and the activities that the students do and the parents put it on the refrigerator. <laughs> That's how I got to look at it. What's wrong with this? Well, can you see how all the arrows are going one way? So in this very efficient keyword, efficient method of teaching, what we see here is the teacher is basically just passing on information from here to here. Now, some school districts went even further in basically designing what this was going to be because they didn't trust the teacher to come up with good design. This was called curriculum maps. 
design roadmap. I've heard it called a bunch of things. And in this model, what happens is the task and the activities, the learning, becomes the center of the whole thing. And it's pretty much the way we generate or we designate success is how well the kids do the task, create tasks, do activities, create activities, how well they do that, that is generally a grade. And we move on. Now, what Marlene is arguing for is that we move away from this very much task activities model to one in which the ideas become the center. And by that, she means the ideas of the learning. Kids' ideas about what they're learning in a community of learners. The activities and the tasks then are generated by kids' ideas. The teacher can present a series of tasks, activities. Kids get to pick the one they want to use to then to test out their idea. It's that simple, actually. Why should we put students' ideas at the center? I really wish we, they, these played. Let me see if this one plays. Yeah, that's okay. Well, I don't want to lose this. Here's the quote from what that video was. I don't understand, but I got it done. Let's go and revisit a couple of guys from uh, 688, Wiggins and McTeague. They have a bunch of mantras they throw out there. My favorite one, though, and they had the one about you can't start a journey until you know where you're going. But here's my favorite one that they do. All education, all learning is understanding that is applied. All education should be understanding that is applied. Now, don't, you know, be careful that I'm not leading you in, in a direction that I don't mean to be leading you in. I'm not advocating here for project-based learning. As you'll see when we get through with this, what I'm advocating here is for kids to exist in a community where their ideas can be challenged in a safe way and they can have their fellow classmates read their ideas about everything and then give feedback. I hope you're starting to see how this might structure into an online class. So here we go. Learning is an active constructive process. Understanding is critical and working collaboratively is preferable to working in isolation. It's by yourself and you only have one idea, yourself's idea and the, pe and the teacher. But if there is many people in the class and they put up their hands and you could think of whatever they say, not only your own things, but everyone will say what they think. And then you have many ideas to think about. So this is such a wonderful quote from this kid. He lived in a classroom where ideas were at the center. But more importantly, because you can say that all day. But more importantly, the technology allowed those ideas to take root and to have real space. And so when I look at my idea, I can see what your idea is and I can see what his idea is and I can see what her idea is. And we're all thinking about the same things. This does not mean that we are throwing out the curriculum. This is not a free for all. We're still very much in curriculum here. But when we start talking to kids about, so what are your ideas about? And it could be something as concrete as, say, slope. When we teach kids slope, we basically teach them an equation. 
do we ever ask them to go further than that with, so now that you understand how slope is uh, solved, what are your ideas about it? Good teachers do that. Here's my classic picture. Collaboration to fuel the powers and knowledge building community. So over here on the left is good old Thomas Edison and his light bulb. And it's a very tight shot of him standing there holding the light bulb. But if you were to pull the camera back, you would see Menlo Park, which is the other part of the uh, slide. Menlo Park was the research and development that Thomas Edison invented that helped him create that light bulb. He gets the credit, but these are the people who also should have the credit. And then there's the famous quote. Now, one of us is smarter than all of us. If we can believe that the ideas about the curriculum are worthy of examining, not just accepting, then what happens is you have this wonderful, rich soup of kids saying things like, you know, we talked about this yesterday, but here's what I'm thinking now. When you have that happening in a classroom, the power of what goes on is just, is just a remarkable thing to watch. So here we are. We now know that knowledge building is learning in an active, constructive process. That understanding is critical. Working collaboratively is much more preferable to working in isolation. And knowledge advancement is based upon improvable ideas by asking high-level questions. The whole point of having an online presence sums up right there. Although I got a few more slides. <laughs> but here it is. The whole point. If I build an online learning environment correctly, people can jump in and put in their ideas about whatever the, the curriculum says. That constructive process of people being able to express their understandings is critical to how this whole thing should work. Within the online presence, what we have is what we can't have in school. That is time. We are so, you know, the clock is our enemy in school and you've had this happen to you. You'll be sitting there and all of a sudden you're just in glory land because the kids are flying, the ideas are flying, um, and then it's the end of the period and we all have to leave or it's lunch or it's this or it's that. The power of this is working in collaboration. Having it live in an online environment means that the artifacts don't go away. Going back to the Larry Rosen presentation that we were watching the other night when Larry says 15 minutes and basically you drop off. Yeah. But if you have put something into a space that you can readily access anytime, anywhere, any place, now you have a way to grow. But here's the other piece. Knowledge advancement is based upon the idea of improvable ideas by asking high-level questions. When we can get kids to start asking those high-level questions, when they start using their epistemic agency, to be able to enunciate, I get this, but I don't get that. What does it mean about this? When we get kids to get into that mode of thinking, my goodness. By the way, I want to stress that in all the years that I did this with schools, and I did this with a lot of schools and a lot of teachers and a lot of kids, this slide right here. You walk into these classrooms, and I've seen everything from a, third grade language art, uh, fifth grade math, great math class, by the way, um, social studies, seventh grade, uh, biology in high school, and everything in between, special ed needs, everything in between. When you can get to this level of a classroom structure, the learning potential and the learning that goes on in the room is almost, it's just remarkable. But it also does something else. We 
also does something else. Kids start seeing how their thinking fits into a much bigger world. See, this, this first part of this quote, Mendel worked on Karen's question. The first part, the kid had to know who Mendel was. You know, he had to know his work with peas. He had to know what a, how he was researching how we pass on genetic information before he could make that statement. And again, the power of all this is the curriculum allows for you to have information that you then play with asking good questions, reading, thinking, sharing, building new questions. And all of a sudden we go from this sort of curricular centric way of doing to where we have kids actually thinking about what the curricular what the curriculum might be lacking or what we need to make the curriculum better another quote from another kid uh, it's really interesting um, a lot of these, you can see that date there in 1995. Uh, that's when I first got involved with it. And um, you can see the old Mac model there in the picture. This was Knowledge Forum, what the kid's looking at on the screen. And Knowledge Forum was pretty much very, very similar to what we can do with uh, Google Classroom. And what we're going to do with Google Classroom. And so as I show you all this stuff, don't let this time stamp throw you in other words you're looking at that going 1995 steve we've kind of come a ways from that yeah we have but the basis of what we did back then we can replicate actually better in the google classroom and if we do it the right way if we encourage this kind of asking good questions looking at the curriculum as ideas that can be improved, collaboration, and a community of learners. Goodness gracious. Here's the last piece. So now we know it's a constructivist process. We know it's understanding is critical. We know working collaboratively is much better than working all by yourself. We know that improvable ideas, asking high-level questions based upon Here's what the curriculum says. Knowledge advancement is also based on a thorough understanding of what you don't know. You know how you say two or three heads is better than one? Well, it's like the same thing on a computer. It's like just what she said. If someone read a book or something and they know more about it, you can go to their note and get some references from theirs, and then it'll help you answer your question better. That's Conway Middle, by the way, those three kids, 20-some-odd um, years ago. wonder where they all are now. Conway Middle was a fascinating place to work because, you know, we weren't working with necessarily the highest level of kids in the district. We, we loved them. They were great kids. But, you know, we weren't working with a advanced program. We weren't working with a magnet school. We were just working with kids. And the startling revelations they had about what we were doing was just remarkable. Loved, loved, loved working with these guys. Uh, and their work that they did in a social studies class, seventh grade, was remarkable because it really showed that given a chance to look at history, kids could see history the way that historians want them to see it. What have we learned? Not just facts, not just, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, but why? Well, he thought he was going to find a new world. And when he got to America, when he found it wasn't the new world, you know, if you get kids to think that way, then understanding is quite remarkable. And then here comes the part about, well, what are we going to do about testing? We've got to test. No, you don't. 
because what will happen here is the whole process, the learning is an active process. Understanding is critical, working collaboratively. You know, working collaboratively, we call cheating in school. It's called working collaboratively on a team in business. Uh, knowledge advancement is based upon approval ideas and by asking high level questions. What take this further? Knowledge advancement is based upon a thorough understanding of what you also don't know. And then what happens at the end of all of that is you have increased opportunities for reflection and self-assessment. Kids will tell you what they don't know. I don't have to give them a test. Now, let's see. Um, I don't need to show you anymore. What I am not going to do now, first of all, I really, 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 let me emphasize that one more time, really want you to read this right here. Okay? And I'll explain why right now. So let me back up a bit and go back up here to the top level. And... Forgive me for reading to you, but I want to really stress this. So I'm not going to read all of it to you. All right. We just went through down here. The knowledge building refers to the process, creating new cognitive artifacts, so on, so on, so on. This is the crux, frankly, of this whole class right here. But where you are right now is up here. Uh, this was a writer in Scarlet Amelia writing in 2003. And they have designed or they've come up with two terms. One's called belief mode. One's called design mode. Belief mode is nothing more than your grounding in understandings of why the way we teach, the why do we do it? This is not PD. Okay. Belief mode is not PD. What belief mode is, is that you have undertaken a way of teaching because you believe in the basis, the basis of that teaching. So when we talk about knowledge building, what we're talking about is in the belief mode, we believe in the ideas that kids can learn at high levels, given they learn within a community. Their ideas are respected about the curriculum. They learn, they have to learn, by the way, how to ask high-level questions. That's part of the, the magic sauce I think people think happens. It doesn't happen. The other thing you have to teach kids how to do is something that we call social discourse. And we break that down into three activities. Praise, question, propose. PQP. Praise, question, propose. And in social discourse, what you have to teach kids, which, you know, we've seen with all this mindfulness stuff that's going on. But what we saw using the PQP model was you could have kids in discussion, both orally sitting face to face with each other um, or online. And if we could get them to use that praise, question, propose model, uh, I read what you wrote or I heard what you said. And I think it really has some good stuff. Uh, question. Did you mean to say this? Question. Have you read this? Pose. How about if we were to uh, join together in the uh, Google Classroom and create a note that we both put our ideas in there and see if we come up with something new. So this is not magic. Okay. This is work. And it's work work. It, it takes a while to build a classroom. Um, when we would start in the fall, we would take teachers and we would take them through a, a heavy PD schedule. And we took them through all kinds of little learning games and activities, etc. And what we were trying to get them to understand was this is not easy. This is not easy. Um, and we want you to take all these ideas and these games back to your classroom. They were so afraid, of course, that they were going to lose time and they would be suddenly behind in the curriculum. And what we found was fascinating. So around about Halloween, 
we'd come back in. And by that time, most of the classrooms were up and running. In other words, they actually had an online presence and they had decided, as we always told them, take one unit. Don't try to do the whole curriculum. Just take one unit and let's see how it runs. And what they found was after they had been running school for a while, but employing the kind of community building activities, social discourse activities, what they found was when they turn kids loose into the environment, it all carried over. And so the question, the questions were high level. The questioning very much followed the uh, PQ, PQP model. And we found, we just found some fascinating things. Let me give you an example or two. Worked with an eighth grade class. So here was the teacher set up. Every year uh, around the Derby Festival, Louisville has a fireworks display. And every year, the police, government comes back with a crowd size. How do you think they get that? Now, the mathematical answer to that would be a sample, wouldn't it? It'd be a sampling rate. And then you basically lay out a grid and you go, okay, so within this grid, if there were X number of people in that grid, we can extrapolate that out. So he basically asked for kids' ideas. Some kids said they fly around in helicopters and count people. I love that one. That is the best. Then some kids had some very efficient manners. They said, well, they have to go through a gate to get into where they sit. And so therefore they, just, they have clickers. I mean, they, you know, they brought a lot of prior understandings to the task. Then they began the exploration of how sampling and extrapolation work together. And there was so much of the ahas and then going back and revisiting, you know, the helicopter people were, were like, we still could do the helicopter thing. And they even design a grid they could carry up into the helicopter that they would then would hold up as they passed over or as they hovered over the group. And then they could say, okay, I have a grid here that shows 10 by 10 and within one 10 by 10, one of those points in that grid, I'm counting this. You know. So in other words, what kids were doing is they were taking their original ideas and they were transforming them with the new knowledge that their teacher had given them. We are in the process right now of belief mode. We are evaluating, we are looking at this stuff that I'm throwing at you. And I hope, and I hope, as I told you, the first one was the, if you want to call it a red herring, you can. It was the first module was deliberately done so that you'd be mad and frustrated about, is this the way this class is going to go, Steve? This is the kind of crap you're going to throw at me. It was deliberately done to set you up. Module two was an introduction of the underlying currents, constructivism, uh, the whole deep inquiry, deeper learning, all of those pieces, and now knowledge building. Design mode is where we're going to go after we get this part of the course done. And design mode will take us into the work uh, and use of something like Quality Matters. And then finally, we will come up with our own design, our own outline, our own shell of a Google Classroom. So here's where I'm going to take you for a little bit here. And then I'm going to... Um, all a day. When I see you again next week, I'm hoping that you'll have, have read this. It's not too long. I think it's about 18 pages. And it's all about the belief and design mode. So I want you to kind of hear from Marlene and Carl. They're thinking about this. Uh, I'm sorry. Marlene's Carnamalia. 
Carl Breyer. They're good friends, actually. Um, I have a bottle of scotch that I keep in their house. So when I go up to Toronto, it's always sitting there waiting for me. It doesn't get drunk very much. Not because I don't go there a lot, because you don't want to drink it a lot. What I have done in here is I want you to read that. Here's where, the, here's where the crux of the matter is, right here. And this I really like, because what we have done here for you is we have videos explaining everything that I just bored you to tears with, with that PowerPoint. This is a good friend, Rich Messina. Rich um, was a teacher there in Toronto. Uh, you're, a lot of these folks you're going to hear from are, are teachers in Toronto and students, and um, Rich was a lead teacher in the uh, elementary school there uh, called, oh gosh, what was the name of that school? The something school, <laughs> um, and he was an early adopter of this. I'm just going to let you listen to him a little bit. I think my speaker will work. In a knowledge building classroom, it's about the community. The community having a responsibility to create a sort of a collective knowledge. Everybody has ideas. That's Marlene. Everybody can grow ideas. If you really want to get started in knowledge building, the key fundamental idea is making sure that the kids are going to ask questions that they feel are the most authentic to them. They love coming to school. And for me, that's huge because a happy student will learn. The students uh, couldn't believe that we would send people on a one-way trip to Mars. What will they do for water? How will they survive? How will they cope with never coming back? When I do knowledge building in my classroom, there's almost an explosion of information. Students are so excited about what they're learning. They're coming up to me and they're saying, Miss, Miss, look what I found, look what I learned. Did you know this? I always explain it to my students as us having a brain dump of all of our ideas and our theories and our wonders and we're putting them all into a big pot and then we improve on them. The challenge is producing knowledge and value to a community. It starts with a natural tendency to play with ideas, but it extends to this really hard piece of continually improving your ideas. Getting the students to see that their learning was progressing, uh, for some of the students, they hadn't had that experience before. Um, they just sort of went through each year and didn't realize, wow, I used to think this, and now I think this. It challenged me of like, thinking about is that one possible is that possible why would it be possible why would it not be possible so how could we figure out how many different designs we can make this is kind of tricky our class is a knowledge building community the students everything happens through discourse and and through collaboration we created a space where we could have that group collaboration and knowledge building circle area we did it with a different approach. We usually do with even numbers, but this time we did it with an odd number and it still worked. Students are all actively thinking, their minds are on. They break out and then come back to reflect and make their connections. Using we and us and our ideas, I think just that intentional language use in itself helps to build that culture of inclusivity. I like using Knowledge Form because it gives everyone a chance I'm going to stop there because now it goes into commercial time. <laughs> uh, that's Knowledge Form. That was the uh, brand that we used. Um, it was an online database, uh, basically where the, the little boxes that you can see up here on the screen uh, represented a note that a kid put in. Now, we can do the same thing. We can do the same thing in Google Classroom, and we can do it really well in Google Classroom. So I'm going to stop there. I would like for you to watch this whole thing, but here's what I really want you to look at, because this is where I'm going to go next week. The 12 principles of knowledge building. These are the 12 principles that Marlene came up with um, that we as a community um, developed working with Marlene. And I think the reason why I want you to really get this into your head is if you can design, because we're still in belief mode, but if you can design and carry these ideas over into that uh, design mode, then things, it informs you. It informs you. This is the thing that most people say about online classes is, well, I don't know really how to design it any differently, so I'll just, I'll just do what we've always done. Sit and get. Take it, read, take a test. 
and it might have some interactivity built into it, kind of like what I'm sitting here doing right now. But if we could have it to where people actually, kids actually can pull their ideas into it and talk about them. So let me go through these real quick and then we'll call it quits. So real ideas, authentic problems, you heard about that in the presentation, me talking about it. How do we actually ask good, solid questions about the curriculum that are based upon kids' understandings? There's so many times in the curriculum when we put an idea out there for a kid, we don't allow them to say, oh, you mean like when I am trying to yeah. Improvable ideas. Every idea is improvable. This is the basis. This is the basis of the American experience. We didn't just say, okay, there will always be a king. You know, we said that the people can build their own government. I mean, every idea is improvable. And it can be little ideas. You know, there's probably a better way that we could organize the crayons. <laughs> or it could be the big idea. We need a government of the people, by the people, for the people. I mean, it's everywhere. We do this constantly. Some of us thrive for this. I do. I thrive for this kind of thing. I love to work with kids and say, so what's your idea about how we can do this? And don't be afraid of the multiple ideas. Idea diversity. Don't be afraid of the multiple ideas because they're going to give them to you. This is mine. Okay. And I'll just let you play with this one. This was uh, when we were building all of these principles. Um, I took this one because I'm a, I really, really, really believe in epistemic agency we could just get kids to the point where they can say here's what i know here's what i don't know wouldn't your job be a lot easier and the collective the the knowledge of the community again to me this is the key to building uh, an online classroom if we can get it to be that community collective where we basically can look into it and say look where we were look where we are what do you still don't understand? Go back over here. Look at John's note. Look at Susan's work. See if that helps. Democratizing knowledge is the idea that all knowledge should be shared. And no one has the key to anything. No one of us is smarter than all of us. Democratizing knowledge. The symmetric knowledge advancement, eh, you know, but really, uh, knowledge advancement to me is nothing more than, so where are we in the curriculum? <laughs> where do we go now? You know, to me, that's, that's pretty much what, what we're talking about here. Where are we going here? The pervasive knowledge building. Oh, my goodness. If, if you can get kids, you heard in that little, by the way, that wasn't stage. That's really how they talk. But if you can get to start talking that way, what I hear you saying, or here's my idea. If you can get kids to start talking that way, the amount of excitement and the amount of advancement that goes on in your classroom is really something. Constructive uses of authoritative sources. Um, this one's kind of interesting. This gets to the idea that we teach kids how to read critically and to look at ideas from others critically. And we, this is what we do in higher ed, if you think about it. You know, I call it name dropping, <laughs> but really what we're doing is we're saying, well, when we talk about what Scarmelia talks about, when we talk about what Abbott talks about, it's not the end. That's not the end, kids. What do you think about what they have said? Turn it around. Give it back to me. Put your ideas. That's why I have you do what I have you do in here. I, last night in the, the 585 class, I had people who were looking at me going, so what do you want in the infographic? I said, I don't want regurgitation. I want to push you to the top of Bloom's little ladder. I want to see th synthesis. 
So do you expect us to put everything in it? No. That's not what synthesis does. Synthesis says, here everybody is saying, and here's what everybody in our chapters that we read, and here's my ideas now. It's hard. You better believe it. Knowledge building discourse, everything I've been sitting here saying. How do we get kids to talk about what we're doing in the class? And how do we do that in a discourse that is respectful, but yet challenging? That's a hard one, especially middle school. And finally, well, actually, no, not finally, but assessment. So we're always, you know, this one always scares everybody because, you know, there's, well, how'd they do on the test? You know what we found? Because we actually did research this. What we found was when kids took uh, standardized tests, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot of difference between the two groups. The knowledge building group and the group who basically just, you know, did what they've always done. Where the difference was, and we don't give these kind of tests anymore, and that's what's so sad, is when we gave the kind of test where a kid had to explain, glad you answered the way you answered, the knowledge building kids blew the top off the test. Their, their scores were just at stratospheric. So when we talk about embedded, concurrent, and transformative assessment, the pushing the, the knowledge forward, kids being able to look back at what they originally wrote and look forward to what they wrote and to realize the change, what, what new information they have. You know, it's that classic little thing that we do, or we should do, on the exit slips. That's that. And then rise above. Rise above is the one that's kind of it's kind of like Pluto. <laughs> you know, Pluto was a planet forever and a day, and then astronomers came and said, you know, really, Pluto isn't really a planet. It doesn't really act like a planet. And so they demoted it. Um, rise above is kind of like that. We we have been arguing and talking about rise above forever and a day. And basically, uh, what what it comes down to is, you take the best thinking at a certain time and then you look at where the questions still remain and you rise above it to come up with new questions, new ideas that pushes the thinking further. So what we're going to be doing, and I'll do this in much more detail next week, um, you are going to create another voice thread. And this one's going to be a pretty heavy lift. Like I said, this, if you want to think of this as the midterm. But I'm not going to just throw you out there. Not just going to throw you out there. You're going to have read this. You're going to have watched these. And then right here, I have, if you want to call it a cliff notes, a cheat sheet, whatever. I have created for you a document. And we'll go over what we're doing next week with the voice thread that will show you how you can look at each one of the principles. Here they are over here on the left hand side. And what I want you to do is you're going to create a slide in the voice thread that basically helps me see your understandings of real ideas, authentic problems through these various lenses. So I have to make a slide for each one. No. You make one slide and you synthesize together all of these uh, ideas that have to do with how real ideas and authentic problems. Here's the what it means. Knowledge problems arise from efforts to understand the world. Not typical end of the chapter textbook problems, but problems drive learning, not just for practice. Um, and then here's the instructional activities, uh, instructional tactics that we can use to do that. We can look at how the role of technology can be used, important, uh, possible obstacles and how to overcome them, and then indicators. How do we know we're getting the job done? Now, on this one, if you want to make your technology focused around what is possible in the Google Classroom, like right here, discussion board to capture, feel free. In other words, if you want to say, well, in the Google Classroom, I could, 
if you don't know Google Classroom yet, you're going to by the time I get done with you. So don't feel like you've got to do that, but also don't feel on this one, you don't have to get a whole lot of detail. What I'm looking for here is, yes, these are very strong prompts. Um, you could just basically paraphrase back to me, but I don't think you're going to do that. I think you're going to combine all of this into your understanding of what each one of the principles are. And as you can see here, they are. There's my baby. Um, this grew out of ideas uh, formulated over years of working with project-based learning, Montessori. Um, you know, those, those kinds of, that's kind of where I came from. So that's why, that's the lens through which I see epistemic agency. Okay, so there's our old friend, the the voice thread. Hey, this is how it works. So for next week, I'm going to hope that you will have read the Knowledge Building and Knowledge Creation One con Concept Two Hills to Climb. I will do a very deep dive into what each one of these principles means, and then we'll go over how to do it in the voice thread. Um, and then we're done with belief mode. We are out of belief mode, and we are fully into design mode because after this comes the framework this is what i i think this class the reason why i like this class so much is that we do do the heavy lifting of trying to come up with a belief mode a system of understanding why we're doing what we're doing and why it's such a paradigm shift and then we go into the pieces that really should inform us how to build something. And then we have the frame, which is so nice because there it is. Quality matters. Gives us the framework. It says, okay, so here's what uh, standard one looks like, standard two, standard three, standard four, and there's nine of them. And if we put all that together, we get this amazing product that then we can put into here. And I tell you what, one of the things I'm really proud about in this Google Classroom module that I think as a teacher, people are really going to like is down here. Here are 50 awesome applications to use with your Google Classroom. And here they are. And they describe them. Now you have a way and I'm kind of giving giving it away, but I will. Uh, one of the features that Marlene talks a lot about in design mode is building something that's very topographical as opposed to flat. And if you think about any kind of online classroom, be it Google, be it, um, what is this thing we're in, Blackboard, be it uh, Schoology, anything like this, you know, they're flat. You, know, you basically, there's one screen, da, 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 da. The more topography that we can put into that experience, go here, do that, come back here and bring it. And that's what all of these are about here. So I can't wait to get into the, the Google Classroom. People. We actually get in and start really designing because we have a framework. We don't have to just make all this stuff up. We actually have a framework called Quality Matters that will teach us how to do this the best way. All righty. I will see you next week. And uh, I hope those of you who are watching these videos that they are um, good. I hope they're making sense to you. And as always, if you have questions, you know how to get a hold of me, that 502-457-2937. Uh, I am being very careful here. I'm trying to keep all of these connections together as we go through it because I want you to realize there is a very much a stream that we are following through. All right. Look forward, as always, to seeing you. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Brittany, for being here. Thanks, Steve. You know Thanks. You know how to get a hold of me, dear. Always.
All right. Bye-bye. Okay. See you next week.